Hey, welcome once again to another one of our Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangouts and to our show, Issues and Challenges in Today's Fire Service. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, and as always, I'm with my good friend and Hump Day co-host, Louisville Assistant Chief Terry McGrath, and we've got another great show lined up for you today. Um, our format is simple. Uh, we Terry and I choose a topic. We invite some really cool people on the show, and we sit back and let it fly, man. There's no script, no nothing. Um, just our topic. So, and also, uh, we always remind you if you have any questions, head over to Twitter um, and send them our way. Just make sure you add hashtag FE Talk, FE Talk, and then we'll try to, to, to get to as many as we can. Our topic today is the search, getting in and doing our job. And uh, we're hanging out with some some great guests, and I'm talking about a bunch of a bunch who truly get it when it comes to what we do in the fire service. Um, we got uh, one of our regulars on this show, and Longtime FDIC instructor and author, Chief Scott Thompson from the Colony, Texas Fire Department. We've got Lieutenant Grant Schwalbe from uh, the Sterile Fire Rescue in Florida. Um, Grant's another longtime FDIC instructor and author, another great, great guy. We've got Battalion Chief Garrett Rice from the Colony uh, as well. And uh, Captain Seth Taylor is on a run oh, right now. Uh, what was we in the fire service as they get back? Um, and you got Terry. We've got so welcome, welcome, guys. Our regulars. Hey, thanks for having us on, Frank. Very good city. Hey, welcome, guys. Oh, welcome, everybody. And Scott, so Scott, um, real quick, uh, mute and unmute again so we get a good clear signal, buddy. If you could just mute and then unmute. Um, uh, two things, Scott. Um, what do you I, I, what do you teach at FDIC this year? And I'm gonna hit you with a second question right after that. Going back with the trace training basics and essentials from the chief to the candidate that went over really well last year. Modified the program. I've kind of been doing and updated it, so we're. Doing that again in a four-hour workshop. Oh, very cool. And now, you got to tell us about your book. We brought that up several times, and I know that's going well. It is going very well and uh, um, getting a lot of great feedback on it and going around doing a few classes when it doesn't interfere with my, my real job that I got to do. <laughs> but, uh, it's it's going, going really, really well, and I appreciate you and Terry and Garrett Rice for helping me with that, but it's, it's going very well. Thank you. Well, and besides uh, uh, through fire engineering books and videos dot com, if they want to get a, like a signed copy from you, uh, where do they have to go? Uh, my website, Scott at fireserviceleadership dot com, and there's a little box in there. Just say if you want it uh, signed and who you want it signed to, and I'll be happy to do it. And I'll get it to you as quickly as I can. Very, very cool. Very cool. Outstanding, buddy. Outstanding. Grant, real quick before we kick into things, um, you're at FDIC, obviously again. Um, doing residential primary search, establishing an aggressive search culture, which is perfect for today's uh, topic and show. Um, you know, let, let's do this real quick. Um, and, and one of the things as we jump into our topic here about search and rescue, guys, um, a good friend of mine, uh, Chief Butch Cobb, Butchie retired from Jersey City, is one of the big chiefs, um, one of the bravest people I know, one of the most humblest people. He's not one of these guys on Facebook who says humble and honored at the same time while they're posting things about themselves. They're humbled and they're honored, yet they're posting shit about themselves. Anyway, that being said, Butch is a, just a very humble guy, a great guy, um, great boss, one of the most decorated people I know from Vietnam uh, as a soldier. Um, he went to work for ISO after that. But Butch, he said a while back, and it's so true, he says, you know what? He told John Salk and I this, he goes, no one has ever been rescued from inside a burning building where we didn't have to go in and, and find them. You know, they, we, you know, people do jump out windows, but we, we've got to go in and we've got, we've got to find them. And, 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 he, and it was a point he was making about, you know, some folks that aren't maybe as aggressive as maybe they should be. And we'll talk about that when it comes to the search, but, but Grant, Grant, go, let's talk real quick because your topic, uh, you know, this particular program at FDIC you're teaching um, is, is one we need that we need to just run through here while we're talking about this. One of the things I've talked about is, you know, some of the Facebook firefighters out there um, that go off about aggressiveness. And, and we've all talked, Scott, you've been out here, we, and Terry and I have talked about this before, about you, you see them and they get on there and they're like, you know, we see the, 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 someone will get hurt and they'll go, see, the fire service is way too aggressive. We're way too, and I'm like, my response, oh, and I even wrote an article on it in a blog, are we too aggressive or just using the wrong word? And, and, and my, 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 my theme has always been, I thank God every day we're aggressive. 
I, I think it's in our very nature. It's what is absolutely necessary for you to be successful as a firefighter or a soldier, a Marine, an airman, a sailor, a coastie, if you're in armed services. You know, could you imagine a Marine looking at his gunny and going, gunny, I don't know if we should charge that hill. They may shoot a bullet at us, and that's could, could be pretty dangerous. People are depending on us. People are, are, you know, when they go to bed at night, lay their heads on their pillows, they're thinking about us, knowing that if something happens, they're they're trapped, they're, you know, whatever, we're coming to get them. Um, I think the word we need to focus more on is reckless. Like I said, I thank God every day firefighters are aggressive enough to make the second floor for that grandmother, get that kid, drag a firefighter out. Um, uh, you know, I, th- I think the word should be, we should be concentrating more on it for another topic is reckless. You, 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 all you guys have watched the videos and you went, stop, stop the video right there. Pause it. Why is he or she, why are they there? Why are they doing this? What reckless is driving too fast, right? Reckless is, is, is not wearing your seatbelts. Reckless is not having a back or reckless is taking your face piece off too soon or not wearing it all. Reckless, you know, there's a lot of reckless things we do to get ourselves hurt, injured and killed. But I thank God every day that firefighters are aggressive. We taught a coordinated aggressiveness and a safe way to go about it. God, God for, for decades and decades and decades. So Grant, run us, run us through real quick your program at FDIC and, and the, like the, the, the bullet points of what you cover, buddy. Well, first we start off by setting the culture. and We look and we say culture comes from confidence. And you look at the search, the search environment and you got people on both sides of the fence that are only go in if you know there's a victim. We got to be safe. Um, only go in if we're told people are inside, and, and that's just kind of the wrong information. So we start out by using a lot of case study to say we need to go inside because that's what they expect. And inaction is going to come bite us in the butt. I know it has in my past. And you look at Parkland shooting inaction by them. How are we going to do that? And fire academy search is horrible. It's search an empty room grab my boot. If heaven forbid you lose my boot. Um, so we're not teaching people the right way. So we start out, you know, you get comfortable learning what we're supposed to do. Now, crawling on three, staying in contact, voice, visual, or touch, learning the three different ways that we're going to do search, whether it's searching um, from the attack point of uh, point of fire ground assignment. And in a busy department where you've got five units arriving on scene at the same time, that's not a big deal. But that plugs into the rural environment. What if you're 10 minutes before your, your second due comes? So that's got to get talked about. Um, when you're in the big city or the resource heavy area, who's doing your searches? Is your second due sitting down at a hydrant waiting to, waiting to make sure that we don't have to charge LDH unnecessarily? Or are they getting in and default getting in and getting that primary search done the f- first five minutes? And then bringing up VES. You know, where there's a known victim location, you can't enter the building through the primary way that the attack team is going through, whether there's fire or it's just bottlenecked. Um, and then, you know, we kind of wrap it up that once we find a victim, we need to have a plan. Um, and, and oftentimes when we're doing our training, guys are just taking out baby dolls. And then when they get to a real victim, they don't have a plan. And so it's going over a couple different plans. So together, when we hit all four of those things, People come out with a better mindset. They say, I know I should do a search. I know how to do a proper search. I know how to get a victim out. And we give them some some ways that they can practice it and how they can do some drills. And, and with the confidence, becomes more aggressive on the other side. So that's the that's, that's goal. Well, and, you, go ahead, Terry. So, well, I just, I was getting back to, because you, you mentioned something early on, which was, which I think I think the fire service now is doing a lot a, a, a pretty good job of gathering intel. So we talk about uh, scenarios at night when there's cars in the driveway and, and what's the, the, the realistic uh, possibility that someone's home, a structure's occupied. Do you have contact with resident? All those sort of things that I think everyone is using to factor. But something you said a minute ago, and I think. You know, it, it, it bears noting that this kind of idea came chief on the heels of what happened in St. Louis. Uh, and, and, of course, the, the scenario out there was that, uh, you know, no one, to my knowledge, when they got there and, and, and started to execute that plan, they didn't go off of a hysterical mother standing in the, in the front yard screaming, my babies are in there. They from, from my understanding is, is, is more or less stumbled into this operationally because it's part of what they do. It's part of the, the standard of 
the service that they're delivering. And I know that Scott, and I've heard him reference this a lot, and I'm sure uh, Garrett's of that same mindset, but, uh, you know, we talk about aggressiveness on the fire ground or talking about committing to executing those vital functions on the fire ground. But I, I know that's something they talk about in the colony, and it's certainly something that's in our playbook here. Well, and, and one of the things I want I want to touch on too, Terry, while 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 Grant was saying, and welcome, uh, Captain Seth Taylor for Louisville. Seth made it; he was on a run, and uh, he got there. Welcome, welcome on board, Seth, for, to today's hump day. Um, one of the things, Grant, that you touched on, I, I didn't want to get past real quick before we get to some of our other guests, it's, is the whole how we train. You know, I've said it for years. We train firefighters to not put out the fires in the academy because we tell them in the academy and the burn buildings don't do what. Don't put out my, don't, whatever you do, don't put out my fire. So we teach them to do this stuff instead of put out the fire. And, and, and the whole penciling thing, which drives me insane, um, uh, you know, that, that crazy stuff. Anyway, that being said, I've never searched a bedroom grant, like you said, that had pallets of straw in it before. And, you know, and, and, and on concrete without carpeting and without different obstacles and things like that and so on and so forth. Um, and the further we get away from sometimes the realistic training, I think the harder it is on people. Um, I'm going to say this before we before we jump in with, with everybody else. And, and Scott, you and I thought we talked about this briefly before we went live. Um, I've said this for years. We start we start teaching firefighter safety and survival at FDIC in 1996. I created a Save at Home program in 1990. Um, but one of the things we realized early on was that we 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 suck at two things in the fire service. As much as I love firefighters, we suck at accepting people's best efforts. We think people just sashay into the firehouse and they're into the job and they're perfect and ready to go. Like I said before, that like they should we expect them to be the McCaffrey brothers from Backdraft, and that's not realistic. The other thing we suck at is search and rescue. Because we've all, everybody that's on this panel today has seen people with 20, 25 years in a job that can't search to save their lives. And and you mentioned the boot thing, um, uh, Grant. I've said before, people who still teach today in academies, um, to hold on to the boot of the firefighter in front of you when they're searching, they're actually not teaching part two of that drill. Part two of that drill is you blindfold them, you walk them into the room, you spin around in circles, help them to the floor and say, find your way out. Because if I'm holding on to your boot, Grant, as I'm crawling, you know, Garrett, I've got your boot and I'm crawling, you know, hanging on to your boot. I'm not searching, I'm hanging on to your boot. And, and if the average, you know, we talk about it in, in uh, the point of no return with flash or if the average size firefighter turnout pants can crawl two and a half feet a second, you know, you add that up five feet into a room, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Well, if I'm hanging out to your boot and I slip and let go and, and, and you make a right and I keep going straight, one, 1,001, one, 1,002, one, 1,003, now we're separated. And all of a sudden when all hell breaks loose and you read the reports later and we go, so how did he get separate? How did she get separate from her partner? Because we're not teaching people from the very get-go how to get on your hands and knees and search. And there are departments out there, guys, that have thermal imagers, the majority now, that some are no longer teaching their people how to search on their hands and knees because they have they have a they have a tick, they have a camera. Garrett, what are you what are you guys doing in the colony to emphasize? And I'll just say it for some of the people out there, the safe aggressive search in the county because i know you guys kick ass you're the real deal in the county you fight fires you go inside you cut holes in roofs when needed you you guys fight fires and do your do your stuff what what what's the mindset you're a battalion chief there what's the mindset with your people and, and how do you how do you stoke that aggressiveness well thanks for having me on chief um i think the first thing is to understand that um we, we've got to give over that ownership to the people who are doing it and I've, I've been in a couple of organizations and I'll say the one thing going for us well here is, is that we have someone assigned to that task. If I showed up uh, to a working fire as battalion and only said, hey, I'm in command and, and said nothing else, my companies are going to work. So there is a company that is assigned to search. Now I can always uh, supplement that with additional. We had a multi-family dwelling the other night and I put uh, three companies uh on search because we had a multifamily dwelling. It was a larger uh, occupancy, but those guys take that ownership. And in our organization, that is done through our rescue company, two person uh, team that is fast and nimble. Uh, they're our inside truck. They're married up with a truck company. And um, we allow those guys to 
own that. And these people uh, are coming to us with um, conferences they want to go to and training that they want to go to. And they're coming back with the information and they're elevating our operations. Um, you know, Chief says it all the time, you know, let firemen be firemen. That's what we're doing. Nobody wants to go in and say, hey, I'm going to do a piss poor job today. So most of the of what we do is getting out of the way of ourselves and allowing these guys to operate. Uh, and we found great success. The other thing that I would say that, 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 I, that I think has really been amazing and Grant touched on it earlier was not just coming out and throwing the babies in the front yard, right, during our training drills. So we added medic only companies. And now when we do a multi-company drill, they're standing by. And when we pull somebody out, they start to work through the entire CPR. And what we've found out is we did one the other day and I had three victims and it, it killed my operations. That was a good thing for me to experience, which the reality is not just uh, striking additional alarms, but that it's going to hamper fire attack. It's going to hamper search. It's going to hamper ventilation because working a full arrest, it's labor intensive. Well, and one of the things, and Scott, you you were you were there early on. Um, I know when I first got to Louisville in 2000, you know, we added an extra company to every one alarm, you know, to report of a fire just for rapid intervention because what was happening then, forget even the fact we, we pull a civilian out, you know, it, it, let's say you do, let's say you make a grab and something goes wrong. We didn't have enough people. And and, and I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up, Garrett, because Scott's been on the show a ton, ton of times before. You know, with Terry and I, um, Seth, you know this because that's how you operate in Louisville. You know, Grant, I know how you are. I, we're all big fans of think big. Think big, think big, think big. Those that think small, those that think we're just going to get this with a two-in-one response or we're going to do this are going to get caught. Number one, if you have a mayday, you're screwed, you're caught, short, you're done. You're, you're outmatched right then and there. Number two, like you said, you know, you come across one and only one victim and bring them out. You know, I, I've got videos from back. I was on the roof for this one job. Scott, you saw the video. Tommy Sherbino making 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 a couple grabs. They, these people stepped over these this mom and two kids on the third floor of an apartment building. We were on the roof cutting a hole, uh, like a baby, a daughter, and a mom. Tommy got to the top because Tommy Sherbino is freaking incredible. Anyway, um, and he gets up there, comes in at a heavy rescue, gets on his hands and knees, boom, finds mom, boom, finds a kid, boom, boom. and and because, you know, of, of a safe, aggressive search, a hard, if you will, count primary search, getting on his hands and knees. Um, but again, when they came they, on video, I've got the video. As they come down, they come out, they're looking and they're like, well, wh where do we go? Now they go to an ambulance that's locked and they, they have mom and they're carrying her and they have to set her on the ground. They're trying to open up. They have to get the cat out, put her on the cot. Then the same thing for the baby and all the rest of the stuff. Every one of us, I love the I love how Louisville runs. The, the, I love how the colony runs. I love how how Estero runs. We're all big about thinking big. Scott, being a boss, uh, you've been a boss a lot, the boss a long time. Tell me about the attitude when it comes to the chiefs and how that trickles down when it when it when it comes to being aggressive with the search and being allowed to, to do it. Well, it's huge. You got to support it. And I'm going to start off with something that you taught me when I was your training guy. It's occupied until we say it's not occupied. It's on fire until we say it's not on fire. And it's not out until we say it's out. And if you live by those rules, then it takes care of itself. You know, uh, we ask our people when we interview them, are you willing to take a risk? And 30% say no. Right off the bat, 30% say they're not willing to take a risk. Of course, they don't work for the colony fire department. But I've got to have either a pessimistic or an optimistic view on survival. And we're going to go in and saying that if there's survivable space, that has to be searched. Uh, for, for victims. And, and that has to be part of the whole philosophy. We're going to go in with the mindset that there are survivable people. And when the truck company goes in, the rescue company goes in and does a search, their mindset is they're going to find somebody. So when they do find somebody, they're not going, oh shit, you know, here I am the search crew and I just found somebody. So, you know, we go to a fire, it's going to be a fire. Our guys are great about coming off the truck and hooking up on, even on smells and bells, water supply, pulling lines, going in and searching. And I think that's got to start from the top that says, hey, we're going to call ourselves professionals. We need to compete with fire on a professional level. And that means every time the trucks goes out, truck goes out, that's game day. we got to give it our best. And, but i got to support that. And I can't be constantly throwing these things, well, 
we're an EMS department that occasionally goes to fires and all that does is demotivate a motivated firefighter. So we got to really watch what we say daily. And are we saying, hey, I support you to go in there and do your job, which is look for those people who are waiting in their bedroom for us to get them out. Exactly. And if you miss it one time, it'll haunt your department for forever. It'll, I want to throw this to Seth, to Seth, uh, Seth Taylor, um, said longtime firefighter and, and company officer in Louisville. Seth, you, you know, Louisville is known and, and, and do a little, little bragging here. Of course, Louisville is known for being, uh, I always said they're a very safe, aggressive fire department. They know when to go in and when not to go in. They know when to come out and when to stay. And you guys are, 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 are hardcore when it comes to search, whether it's either one of the tower ladders that run with your five guys, the OV, um, uh, you know, Seth, walk us through the mindset there with your truck companies. And like I said, sometimes, you know, the chief, one of the chiefs has to turn to an engine and say, I need a primary from you. But the mindset there is the same too, right? We're going in to see if that, you know, whether people tell us to summon or not, we're going to do a search, right? Absolutely. And that's what with the truck crews, we, we know that that's going to be our assignment if something comes up along. Uh, we have the mindset whenever we're stepping off, the guy behind me and the, the officer on the truck, we're going in for search and, and we're, we're dedicated to that task until, until the point comes that we can't or it's done. Um, and I say it can't, we've had some that were just so heavily involved that there's fire coming out. And then later on we get reports that people have made it out and whatnot. So absolutely. Well, and, and exactly. And I remember watching Richard Lee, um, great, great captain, great mentor, Mr. Calm. You could blow stuff up right next to him and he would go, that was his look, you know, no excitement. I remember Bunker Hill when we had the two kids trapped in there and the dad gave, gave the first two companies cause he was disoriented. He rolled out the wrong side of the home, came out and said his kids were down here and everybody was focusing in there. I remember Richard in there. I remember telling Darren Murray he was on the nozzle, you know, put your captain out. He says, pull him out. I said, Oh, put him out because he was so deep into trying to get to these kids. And, and Scott, you said it. We're their last resort. We're, we're, we're you know, um, it doesn't mean you have to be stupid and, 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 and do bad, you know, make bad choices when it comes to how we do our job, but they're depending on us. The, the people, you know, my, my, my buddy John said it great once. He said, you know, you, you, you pull up at, at two o'clock in the morning, some mom's downside, say my 10 year old ran inside to get the dog. You take your helmet off the mask up. There's not a number one in there. There's number two in there. And then, like you said, Seth, now you get in there and you make the determination. This is where experience and training pays off as to how far we bury up, how far we go in, what we do, which floors. I've always said they can order you to the roof. They can't order you on it. They can order you to the second floor. They can't order you. You know, you've got that's where the, the crew, there has to be some trust where they go in. And, and, and they're working and they call and say, chief, we can't make the floor. And you have to trust them that they can't make the floor. You know, but when they go to bed at night, Mike Lombardo said it best, former commissioner, retired commissioner from Buffalo. He said, when those people lay their heads on their pillows, Scott, this goes back to what you're saying about the whole EMS fire thing. You know, they're thinking about us. Maybe not like, right, like they're, 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 they, they lay their heads in their pillows knowing that if, if they were if tonight, if they had to face the most god awful thing imaginable, being burned, in a, being burned alive, that you, the firefighter, is coming after them. And, and, and it's not about how many fires we fight, it's about the next fire we fight. It's always about the next one. And that's why we train. And it goes back to what Grant said about realistic, realistic training. Um, and, and get it done, Terry. Well, so, you know, something came to mind when, when you're listening to this, because I and I think probably across the board around here, I think everybody's got a great May Day plan as far as we know that if you encounter a May Day, we instantly strike an extra alarm. We call for more resources, but we ramp up because we understand the the chaos and the labor intensive nature of mitigating that hazard. But in reality, it's the same thing I think you're talking about in, in extracting a victim from a fire. And so in, in Louisville's case, if Captain Taylor and his guy get off and affect a search, they find a victim. Those two guys are out of commission and not just those two guys, but they're going to be able to remove that person by themselves. Uh, Seth's, uh, Seth's one of those country strong guys, but he's not that strong. 
So, but, you know, getting back to practicing with, with plastic babies and things like that. So the reality of removing that victim, and I, I say that based on the, the situation we had last year where we removed a, a, a you know, a, a, an adult female from a second story apartment, but, but it took probably six guys inside the bedroom and another four on the ladder outside. So your entire operation has come to a standstill. So, but, and that's one victim. So, so, you know, you get back to St. Louis thing, they got four victims. And a long, long time ago when I was a cop in a, in a previous life, we used to have this idiotic policy that said, if you chased a car, you're only allowed to have two cars in the chase plus a controlling supervisor. Now we didn't equate, we didn't make an equation for the number of officers. It was cars. So if I'm a single officer in a car, that's one. And then another single officer, in a car, that's two and a controlling supervisor, which he was a supervisor. So when this thing came to an end, he wasn't doing much anyway, but, you know, talking on his radio, there could be four people, four bad guys in that car. So one day, a sergeant, I, I watched him get into it with a deputy chief who was chastising him about the number of vehicles he allowed in a, in, a, in a car chase. And he said, let me tell you my rule of thumb. It's two officers for every person in that car. And I still think we're, we're under, you know, out man. But there was a lot of logic in what he was saying. And I think it gets back to when you talk about training, when you talk about have, have a plan, when you talk about the, the, a lot of times the training evolution stop at the accomplishment of the, the goal is to find the victim. Hey, we found the victim and it's done. No, it's not done. There's a lot more. To, to, and so we're seeing this with the mass shooting or the, the active threat training that we're doing because we circle our medics, you know, because we're only going to commit a couple of medics. And so we're going to pick six patients up. So we pick them up, we drive around the corner, they jump out. We, we drive back around the corner. Hey, we're back in play again. But the, the fallacy of all that is, is that number one, the people running the incident, or we get this false sense of, of that we're, we can mitigate this hazard, when in reality you can't. That ambulance left and any coming back. any coming back for an hour or you know whatever the case may be. And uh, certainly when we're taking a victim out, like our, our, that second story rescue last year, I mean, there's probably eight guys, and, and for Louisville, that's that's three companies that have assignments on that fire ground. So you better, you know, number one, based on intelligence, pre-arrival, start ramping things up. And certainly when you get there and you realize what, what your situation is, you better ramp up early. And that's that's my thought. Well, and, that, and that's a great point. And that goes back to thinking big, Terry. You hit, it, you hit the nail on the head with, you know, think about how many medics it takes. If you bring one baby out, one person, forget how many people it takes to get them out of that particular situation. This goes back to what I said, you know, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, there were other chiefs. Scott, you remember this. There were other chiefs in the area there uh, that used to, I don't care, they used to give me, blow me shit behind my back and make fun of me or whatever because we always ran, we always ran with, with a lot of people. I said, the reason we were so successful at fighting fires is because we brought a lot of people out of water to the fire. And, and if you turn around, you know, it's like my, my mentor, Chief Tom Freeman, one of my many mentors, said, a good officer is the one that can predict his or her next alarm. Any mope in a white helmet can stand in front lawn, burn to the ground what you have in front of you. You turn around and don't have enough help, enough help there, shame on you. It, it, and, and Grant, I'm going to throw this one to you, buddy. Um, and we, we mentioned this before, Terry, but everybody's pretty much brought it up. Two o'clock in the morning, and, and I, I've always said this, you know, being one of the one of the original people on the Ocean Respiratory Standard when we talked about two and two out and actually structure fires was an afterthought. You know, it was like we're talking ideal jamish when you talk to them. They're they you know, if, depending on which attorney you talk to, when they talk about you can you can throw two and two out the you know, out the window if rescue is imminent. Rescue imminent to them means somebody's outside saying, Lieutenant, you know, fire, firefighter, probably my, my my kids in there. Well, two o'clock in the morning. That's not always the case. And I know what it did. I remember Calvin Allison. I love Calvin. You know, one of our retired captains. I love Calvin. We had him on the show. I remember pulling up Terry and Scott. You remember, I asked Calvin, I said, Calvin, so you got here with just the three years on the engine. Um, you know, this is right when two and twelve was heavy there in the state of Texas. I go, what were you thinking? He goes, Chief, I don't know what happened to him. There was a guy out here on the sidewalk telling me they're in there. He must have left. And I'm like, you know, you pull up and it's, it, 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 you know, you pull up at a strip mall at two o'clock in the morning. There's no cars in a park lot. You go in there without two, you know, all right, shame on you. But you pull up at a residence at two in the morning or hell, look at this. Those kids, guys, that was one o'clock in the afternoon in St. Louis. That wasn't two o'clock in the morning. It was one o'clock in the afternoon. And 
And, 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 you know, this whole thing, well, it's a vacant building. Well, you know what? Then be aware of all the traps you can fall into when it comes to vacant buildings. But we pull people out of vacant buildings. Grant, talk about the whole, you know, go, no, go. And, um, you know, two o'clock in the morning, you pull up and, and trying to make that, you know, I, I don't want to say trying to make the decision, but some people are a little leery about making a decision because they're worried about some nitwit boss that's not like a Chief Thompson that's going to jump their ass if they go in without having enough people there. What's your thoughts on that, buddy? I think we need to have a real, realistic discussion on what your response model looks like. I know I sit around at the stations in my area and we talk about it. And I said, man, if you sneeze, you're going to be second due to your own fire. So let's, you've got the people. Let's just default to go inside. Make that be the plan. Uh, you know, maybe you get to the rural areas and you, you may have a little bit of a delayed response, but you know, then again, I haven't seen a whole lot of cases where people are getting jammed up. I think there was one that came to mind from last year. Um, but it's not like it's happening all the time. It almost seems like a, uh, a reason not to go. Uh, but again, when you come back to realistic training and guys are comfortable with their skills and bosses are getting out and, and seeing what their crews are capable of, they're going to be more comfortable going in there. And like you said before, if the whole second floor is lit off and I get assigned search, I'm not going through the second floor looking for a death wish. I'm going to search the first floor. I'm going to get up to the top of the stairs. If I can't do it, I can't do it. And then make the, make the communication to, to command, hey, we are unable to make the second floor. And at that time, maybe he assigns a VES to, to, to try it from the other way. Well, and Garrett, let me, let me throw this one at you, buddy, about searching above the fire floor. That's something – that we train our people to do. If you think you're going to drag a hose line with you through this whole building, you're not going to get much searching done. And, and if, if the fire, if, if all indications we've got, you know, fire on the first floor, we're searching a floor above or wh whatever. Um, and we're at the, the initial throes of an incident. You pull up and you got your head, you attack her doing this. You're trying to get a backup line to settle up, which is always hard to do. And you're trying to get a writ team established. You're trying to get someone to do some ventilation. You got a search team going in. And you pull up and it's a two-story residence, you know, and you're going to, I mean, I know in the county, you guys are hot on training people to uh, how to properly search uh, uh, above the fire floor. Uh, we are. And, you know, the, the part of that is, is everybody on the uh, incident supporting that. Uh, I was speaking yesterday with one of my good friends, Mark Combs, who's a battalion in Dallas. And we were actually talking about search. Uh, we were talking a lot about um above the fire floor. And one of the things that goes into it is supporting it. And he was saying uh, that, you know, our backup line needs to not be in the front yard. If we've got a fire on the first floor, that backup team needs to be in the stairwell and they need to be cooling the gases that are going upstairs so that we can affect the search. That's how we support that. But the backup team doesn't need to be standing in the front yard with a hose line at the front door, you know, waiting to be called in. Um, and, and so it's a different mindset. Um, I just, I still go back to the fact that I, I feel like it's got to be owned by everybody and we want to put the fire out, but I think we have to remind people we're stretching a line to get inside to affect a, a search. Uh, and after that, we can just fight a ton of fire and have a lot of fun, but that's why the line's going in in the first place is right. so that we can affect the search. Um, and, and I know for me, I breathe a sigh of relief when, when my, my rescue company says primary all clear cool. I, I have options now. You know, I have a lot of things. I don't have to risk firemen at this point. We can, you know, we, we can maybe downplay the incident a little bit, but until I get that, I sure as heck don't want to take on the risk of leaving a civilian inside. Well, exactly. Seth, you guys are, I always talked about pretty fortunate because you're able to, in your particular area, you're able to run with a lot of people in Louisville. And by the time you go mutual aid, it's, it's usually pretty substantial, but you're showing up with, you know, about half the year with four guys on an engine and five on the truck. You've got an outside vent person who's going to affect some things and soften the building and take care of a ton, about 100 items, just the OV, let alone maybe pop a door and search inside a back door or window or whatever. But you guys, I know, are aggressive when it comes to to get to the second floor or get to the, to the floor above. Um, cause I watched on the front lawn and, 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 and watch you guys, uh, how, how, how important is let's get back to the whole training end of it 
build confidence in your guys. You've been, you've been there a long time, been a captain for a long time. W- what does it take to get that confidence in your guys to where they, you know, newer firefighters are with an officer going, hey, I'm, we're, th- he's taking me out there, she's taking me out there, this is what we're going. Well, it's been pretty interesting. We, we've actually had to develop crews for our new truck that went in service a year ago. And we had, we got to look and we had, a, we had a good solid crew. But as we move along, we had to start developing that. And we actually went to a really active program where we take new guys in. And we really concentrate on force entry and search for about six months. Um, they get to go in with our older or senior guys. And we, we work through that, that pace that we need to keep on a, on a primary search. And that's, that's where guys get caught up. Um, you know, you have lots of tools to do search with. A thermal imager is a great tool, but if you try to walk behind it, it takes you forever to do a search. You need to learn how to do good search with your hands and your ears and your, and your, what you can feel and, and what you can hear and then move on from there. And you can add in that, that tick. And, and, and now you have a compliment. In it. We also do oriented search and they had to get used to doing that. They have to be, be comfortable. Um, through the training aspect to be able to push on ahead as we go through, push them out, they're pushing them into the room. And then as we come back, we stay oriented, move on through that. Um, probably the biggest thing is that, is that steady pace. And we try to, we try to get them a little bit under duress, um, you know, doing some other things before we jump in and do a scenario. It's also hard in a, in a concrete building with steel, you know, concrete, steel and wood. Everything's hard. Versus whenever you start throwing other stuff in their couches and beds and clothing and that kind of stuff and making them pay attention to that. And um, once you focus them up on that, usually guys are pretty good on it. So. And, and Scott, how, just what Seth said, how important is it, Scott, you know, when you, when you have a house, they're going to demo, you know, a house you could go and play in a building that's not the concrete with the pallets of straw. God bless. I, I love the training towers. Don't get me wrong. But the realism you could do just by, even with phony smoke, I mean, yeah, nice to have heat in there, but given somebody reduces their visibility, where like Seth said, you're actually putting couches and chairs and furniture and things and carpeting and stuff, and they're working their way through something that's not that one burn building there all the time. I mean, I, you, you've been a trainer since I met you for the first time. You've been training people for, for your whole career. Um, how important is it to, to add the realism to it? Oh, it's very important. When I was in Arlington, one of the things we did is we would take pictures, even going in on medical calls, you know, somebody would grab a picture and, and come back and, and say, okay, let's create this in whatever environment we can. I mean, if we could get a house, that's great, but you can still do it. Like carpet on the floor, junk, uh, toys, shoes, uh, extension cords, all those things. And, and I think that's part of this whole search culture, whatever you want to call it thing is, is, is that, Let's make it as real as we possibly can. And then even on those ones when we do do a search, let's come out and really talk about it and really get a feel for what were the things that the guys in there doing it had to deal with. Make a mental note of that. Let's try to recreate that in training. And we got to do it regularly. You know, we used to do the quarterly big five and we kind of added search to that. But if you're not practicing this every every quarter or, or a couple times a year, you're going to lose it. And I, I think you got to keep putting people in that environment. Not that it really becomes second nature, but so that they get very comfortable thinking and making decisions in that environment. And you can never do too much of that. Well, and, and again, it comes back to what everybody's saying here about training. Hey, I want to say, uh, Secretary, let me let me make this one point here, buddy, um, about you know every one of us that's on this panel. I think have been successful. Don't take that the wrong way, folks, to our viewers. Successful in the fire service because we believe that training is the backbone behind everything we do. And it's training, training. I, my, my saying forever has been every day is a training day. Um, I, I've said this before, guys, when it comes to, you know, first of all, if, if, if you're a company officer, you're not training your people all the time on how to stay oriented in a burning building, you're not doing your job. Number two, let me, let me, and, I, and I, I throw this out in a lot of classes, especially when I do uh, sweat the small stuff. I, I point to the outside. I said, every one of those people out there, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, all them people out there, they get to use the five what that God gave them to do their job, the five senses. And I ask them, so, so what's the first one? They all go sight. They go, how much, how much vision, how much sight do you have in a Bernie Billy? Duh. What's the next one? Well, it's touch. Well, with the bozo gloves, how much, how much touch do you have? What's the next one? Well, hearing. Well, hearing is probably the best, but with regulators and hoods, it's still muffled. What, what's another? Well, it's taste. 
Enough said. What's next? Smell. I told him, I said, so let me get this straight. You're, you're asking me, you're asking me, Chief McGrath, as my, my boss, my incident commander, to crawl into a burning building, a building that's under demolition because everything was put in it to hold it up as, as leaving via the smoke and flames, to crawl in there and search for the scene of the fire and any possible lost or trapped documents with little or no use of the five senses everyone else gets to use. If I showed up at a construction site like that, they'd send me home with a CNI dog and a white cane. Tell me that training, everything we said, guys, training in the basics isn't important. Go ahead, T. Well, I was going to ask uh, Grant, because I know you do a lot of training in search. So, uh, and, and you had mentioned that, that you've got a, a confidence drill to help kind of uh, kind of nuance these people into, into that particular task. Can we talk about that? Yeah, we set it up. Um, we set it up for the FDIC hot even. We, what we do is we set up a house and the walls are built of pallets and Jersey barriers. And we put furniture and everything in there like that and let all the guys huddle around the house. And we show them what a search is supposed to look like. We show them the pace. We show them how to hit a bed. We show them how to hit, um, you know, monkey move for bunk beds, how they can orient. Uh, the oriented guy is going to dump the firefighter in, how we can leapfrog rooms, how we can get low for life fire layout. Uh, we even put a cone in there. We go, okay, here's the fire. Where are we going to go? Because so often, you know, we just tell these students and even even recruits, you know, hey, we're going to show you some videos in class. Um, and then we just kind of expect them to do their thing. And heaven forbid we put them in fire gear. They're not used to being in fire gear. And then we smoke them out. They've never, never even seen what a good search looks like. So show them what it looks like and then let them do it. Let them do it when they're not stressed in the environment. They can ask the questions. They're more comfortable with it. And then we, we put them in the messed up environment. Uh, it seems to translate that they're much more confident and, and have the skills to, to win. And, that, and that's getting in there and getting down and dirty and searching on, you know, you know what I'm saying? Getting back, like we said, to the basics about search and, and, and opening up their eyes to, to how to do it and all the, all the good things that sometimes what can happen and so on and so forth. Scott, our good friend, Tommy Trevino, Tommy's, you know, we, we call old school, you know, he, he's old school. Tommy's a great, great leader, great mentor. When he used to teach search, he used to tell you, he goes, you know, when you get to that, when you get to that lane and you get to that hallway outside the bedroom, it's very, because everybody's so, I get off the rig. I'm already, I'm running through the door. I'm not looking up. I'm not looking at smoke conditions, the house. I get inside and then I'm like, how do I get out of here? And I'm like, did I crawl into a cube? No, there's windows and doors in this thing. Tommy, Scott, you remember, used to sit there and tell you, right? He'd tell you, you get, you get to that, that second floor in that bedroom, whatever. It's two of them, whatever. And you stop, you take a breath, and through your mask, you yell, Fire department, is anybody in there? And, and you stop and you listen. And, and you mentioned this before about listening for things, you guys. And sometimes you'll hear a moan or a groan. You know, there's, there's sounds we're all familiar with of things when things are on fire, stuff falling off walls and that. But there's thuds, there's noises, there's moans, there's whether it's pets or people or whatever. And I think we've gotten away, Grant and Scott, from some of the good older school stuff. Older school stuff. I'm, you know, saying, you know, saying, saying that we're saying that we're you know, we're going left or right. Left and, or right. And, 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 um, uh, you know, uh, go to the second floor or that you know, that whole thing. Stop it and saying, can anybody hear me? I mean, Scott, we we've kind of went away from some of those things that are still vital. And, and it's a lot of what Grant teaches in his class. No, we, we certainly have. And, and I understand that a lot of departments have staffing limitations and, and they've got to work with that. But to me, that makes all the more case for having assigned people do those searches when we can do it so that they can remember those things and hone those skills and get, get really, really good. But I, I just want to also back on something that you said earlier, Rick, about trust. And we've really got to trust our officers and our firefighters to go in and, and, and make the good decisions and allow them to do it. You know, a, a chief that won't allow a crew to search uh, without having that hose line right beside them or, or, or any of the other things, you know, the positive pressure fire attack, all those other things. We're professionals. We are, we are well-paid professionals. And I, I include volunteers and professionals, very professional uh, volunteer organizations. But that's a very, you, you explain the skill required. You take away our senses and we got to remember these things. And, and fires are a commodity. We learn something. We should learn something every fire that we apply to the next one. And, and everybody's always, we're changing up and 
everybody's doing something different and we're not allowing our guys to really acquire those old school techniques that were passed on to the generation before. You know, Richard Lee is a great example, man, the things that he could tell, the little technique stuff that you're not going to find in any book and, and then carry that through and practice that fire after fire after fire. You know, it, it's like putting somebody who's never played shortstop on shortstop and hitting them ground balls. How successful are you going to be? Getting the fire service, well, that doesn't apply to us. Hey, Joe, go do a search. Well, I haven't done a search in five years. Well, we're setting them up for failure. So those things are so huge. Everybody developing their own talent, their own their skill, their senses. I mean, I don't know how we can be successful without doing that. Well, and, and that goes back to, and Garrett, I want to ask you this. You know, Terry mentioned, or you, know, you guys mentioned before, you know, um, I, and one of our panelists, Seth Taylor, Captain Seth Taylor, um, you know, one of the best guys with, with, with anything with a motor on it, let alone just saws and everything else, and does a great saws class. I mean, we'll, anyway, there's so many great things, four so on and so forth. You know, Seth, and I'm not to embarrass Seth, Seth built like a brick shit house. I mean, you'd want him on your football team if you're playing football. But, but Garrett, you know, the thing I think a lot of people realize is finally that this is a team sport. And, it, and it's, it's, sometimes it's more right about technique. And this goes back training your people how to work with a partner and how to drag a civilian out or down firefighter as a team. Or if you're by yourself and maybe you're not that, that big guy or gal, you know, to, to be able to get someone into a room, a place, a safe refuge, close the door behind them, get to a window, whatever. But just touch on the whole teamwork part of this and training to that end of things. Well, as far as, uh, you know, teamwork, those guys, the people who are going to be doing it, again, the ownership, those companies, uh, whoever you have assigned to that uh, has to take on that role. And so sometimes we'll, I'll hear the argument, well, you know, that's based on your model. You know, if you've only got two people or you, well, if you've only got a small force that, that is, uh, arriving, then you're going to take on more risk. That's the way I see it, really. Uh, it, our job becomes a little easier because we have the people uh, assigned to it. If you look at the statistics right now on on uh, fires, they're down 6%, but our fire fatalities are up 10 So we're going the wrong direction. And I, I've started with the rescue company and that ownership, and I, and I challenged the guys. I said, okay, in our bread and butter we call them Fox and Jacobs houses. They're small, you know, 1,200 to 1,500 square foot house. What is my expectation for command that I can expect you to affect a primary search in normal operations? What's the time? We have to create standards. And we ha and all of that goes back to not just the search, but masking up, coming off the rig, ready to roll. Um, you know, on those EMS runs, looking at the, the building construction so that we know where the bedrooms are. We don't we don't have the time uh, when someone's not protected to goof around in the front yard trying to figure this thing out. That should have been done well uh, ahead of time. Last week in, in the colony, we went through reading smoke and we, we ran out like 15 different videos and went through some of the principles of it and allowed our people to give size ups so that we're talking the same language. All of that, the smoke conditions, fire conditions, building construction, that really goes into having a successful um, operation putting those guys in that environment and then starting to allow them to work um, together and having the same people assigned, not just bouncing people around because you got a warm body, but, but saying you're the guy that's doing this. We did a drill um, uh, earlier this year. We do multi-company drills and I just said, okay, you're going to respond and here's what you got. And so the guys checked out, but right before the drill started, you know, we've got fake smoke. I stepped into the container. And I hid in the back and I started coughing and screaming for, for help. And it kind of panicked them. And it's because we've been training with dummies that don't talk. And so I had them carry me out, coughing and sputtering. The medic crew obviously attended to me. But it was, it was trying to put some realism in what we do. Well, exactly. And, and you, you touched on something. I sat through a guy's class. I think, Scott, you may have too. Um, I sat through a guy's class. And, and he, he, he started counting off. He said, it takes me this long to put my, we talk about response times and being, like you said, being able to mask up and everything else. And he talked about, those are not your seconds. That's their seconds. Those are their seconds, right? You just said it, Garrett. And he, he, he started going off. He says, okay, so I get off the rig. This is how many seconds it takes, takes me to get off the rig safely. This is what it takes me to grab my tool. 
this is what it takes me to take my helmet off, to put my, and he started rattling off. I don't know if Scott, if you remember, he started rattling off how many seconds it takes him to put his face piece on, how many seconds it takes to put his hood on, to put his helmet on, to put his gloves on, to put his face. And he, and, and, and he was able, he goes, look, I was able to cut two and a half seconds off this, four seconds off this, five seconds. And before you know it, he was capturing this time. It was just what Garrett said, man. He can't, I mean, we're talking seconds. And, and I've said before, lay down, hold your breath. That's how long you're holding your breath, waiting for that firefighter to get in the building and get to you. So, so again, don't get off your drills, you know, training and getting your stuff on and off, getting into the building, you know, knowing your job, you know, you know shaving seconds off of what you do. It, 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 again, they're not your seconds. They're, they're their seconds, right, Tara? Yeah, and you know, the, this comes back around to it. Obviously, the focus of this hour was search, but you know, everyone wants to be the guy flying the, the F 18 and landing on the carrier. And, and you know, the, there's a lot of shit that has to happen to make that work. And if you think that the dude in the belly of an aircraft carrier that's monitoring the, the pressure in a line that's arresting a, a plane or or providing the propulsion acceleration to get a plane off the deck. If you think his job is any less significant than the dude flying that plane, you've lost your mind. And so to Garrett's point, when you talk about ownership and talk about empowering people, but the other part of this is to make sure that everyone knows their job and their job is every, you know, listen, there's not a guy here that wants to be at the plug, right? I mean, that's just, you know, whatever. And, and we even say it around here. You know, guys don't want to do the writ thing because everything else goes so well, we don't have to do it. So now, well, I'm just sitting here. It's the most important thing. But everything you're doing, that guy pulling levers, that dude hooking up to the hydrant, your incident commander, everyone has a job. And it's extremely important. And I think, you know, Seth can speak to that because there's a lot of moving pieces when they come off. We run a five-man truck crew. And Seth is absolutely counting on that OV guy. And he's absolutely counting on the high side. So, you know, and, and I think that's worth mentioning. And it's certainly worth something that you have to constantly reinforce in an organization is uh, it's truly how important everybody's role is to make it all work. Well, and Seth, you know, one of the things I always bring up, but is, you know, two things. And, and Scott, you remember Sal Marchese, Lieutenant Sal Marchese, as they call him at FDNY, 111 truck and 142 truck at Queens. 30 plus year veteran, great, one of the best truck officers you'll ever meet. I remember Sal, you know, I went to run out with him and that morning they had a fire and the only window that wasn't showing fire is the one his OV went in to search, to do a, to do a veteran search and found an unconscious guy and drug him out. Um, you know, Seth, we've been, we've been talking for years about being, being good and, and aggressive, getting in there and searching buildings um, and, and going in there now Great. I love the whole close the door campaign. I think it's vital for people to know that, for civilians to know that you can close the door for your kid's bedroom. We've said that for years, you know, and, and we've had, I've been, I can't tell me fires where we've gutted this side of the building and the hallway, you open up a door to a bedroom and there's nothing wrong with it. And there's barely a wisp of smoke in there. That's all the more reason, right? Seth, I mean, to get in there because we're telling people we're coming to get them. We're telling them, close your door, keep your doors closed. And, and the proof is all over social media. Here's another picture of this is all gutted and this door is open, the room's fine. All the more reason that we need to get in there and get after people, right? Absolutely. And that's what, there's sometimes we don't have doors there. Um, if they're if the door is closed, we may have very tenable space. Um, the other thing I can think of recently, it's been about probably a year ago, we had a big townhouse fire. It was actually wind-driven fire, multiple townhouses. And I sent one of my, my my guy in. I'm standing, watching, uh, running through the tick. And it turned out it was in the living room. These things were so cut up, you couldn't pick out which one. One, some of them were bedroom, some were living. And he gets in there. There's no bed. There's no door. The other thing is the way that it was set up is there. It was actually funneling heat from the back of the fire to the front whenever we took the window. And he says it's hot. I said, well, at a certain point, get out. I'm right here. Come back to me. And if we can't do it, we can't do it. But we damn sure try. Well, exactly. And, and again, that's that point where they're counting on us. And we'll go back to what Butch, Chief Butch Cop said. 
you know, we've no one's ever been rescued from inside a burning building without us going in and getting them. I mean, and if we're again, like you said, said if we're going to teach them, we're going to train them and, and tell people, you know, preach to them and keep the doors closed. And we, and again, the pictures are all over the place of gutted buildings, gutted interiors, except for that one bedroom. Then we have to be, we have to be responsible with our jobs. Hey guys, um, we're closing in here, and and and, and Joe, our producer, is very good with letting us go over a couple of minutes here, but. Uh, uh, let, let's do some closing remarks here, and uh, we'll just kind of go around the around the room here, our hump day hangout. And uh, I, I guess let's let's talk closing thoughts on search and rescue, getting in and doing our job was our topic. Um, Grant, let, Grant, you're going to be again, if, folks. If you go to FDIC, anything that if that if you catch Grant in the hallway, um, that's going to be better. If you, for five minutes, it's going to be better than most training sessions you'll ever be in. Um, just be able to talk to him for a few minutes. Uh, Grant, closing thoughts on, on, like I said, our topics, you know, doing our job to get into searching. We just got to do a good job letting everybody know where it fits. And Chief, you've talked about this in your class. We got to get water on the fire because it makes everything better. Stretching that hose line is going to give us time to get those searches done so we don't have to search with a hose line. And we need to trust that attack team is going to do their job and not put down the hose and go after the victim. That'll allow us to get our, our, our searches done. And, you know, as we're training, make it realistic. Throw some fans in there to move some smoke around. Not every house we go in has smoke in every room, yet it seems like every time we do training, it's even smoke throughout. So guys can get used to looking at the conditions and trying to decide, are they bringing them out the front door, or is it going to be better to take them out a window? Um, and just, just make things realistic. And if you need to get some good resources on what's actually happening on the fire ground, firefighter, res uh, firefighter rescue survey is information from people that are making grabs every day. And they're saying where people are found, what the conditions are, and all that. It's a great tabletop exercise. So check that out. And mention that again? Uh, FirefighterRescueSurvey.com. That's, that's a good resource for people. Um, yeah, again, to, to, to check out. Great, great, great point, uh, uh, Grant. Um, Scott, from the big chair, chief, uh, for, a fire, for a fire chief who's still one of us, if you will, you're one of those that hasn't forgotten where you came from. Closing thoughts on, uh, on, on the whole search thing. To the one person that has a fire, fires aren't down. They shouldn't suffer because we're running around believing this. You know, prevention is huge and we need to work on that. But here's the other thing I'm worried about, Rick, and, and this is going to happen. We're seeing our brothers in blue being held to a higher level with the, all the active shooters. What happens when we find out that you have a better chance of surviving in Truck 1's district than you do in Truck 5's district? Because the captain of Truck 1 is well-practiced, well-rehearsed, believes in better inner search. And the captain of Truck 5, because there's no standard coming from the top, the chief says, you know, figure it out, do what you're going to do. And the truck captain over on truck five, oh, vent inner search is too dangerous. Vertical vent is too dangerous. You know, we're not going to do those things. What happens when our citizens find out about that? That, that That's concerning me. But uh, it's my job, I think, as the chief to support, create an environment where our firefighters can be successful and survive and support them to do the job, the mission that we get paid to do, period. Let them be firefighters, right, Scott? Yes, sir. Let them be firefighters and they'll do wonderful things. You know that, you know, I just want to say that one last thing, right? You know, we were, when I was taking the job there and I said, you know, I don't know how you do things. You said one thing, you said, take care of the guys and everything else will fall into place. Man, I, I think about that every day and that's letting firefighters be firefighters. That's it. That's a great, that's a great point, Scott. And it works, man. If it don't look like a firehouse, don't taste like a firehouse, smell like one at eight. So that's a great message. Um, Seth, Seth, final thoughts on search. So probably the best thing, especially at the company level, you know, have a good plan, train. Um, if you have the opportunity that you're doing fires, learn from those events. Uh, consider your neighborhoods. Some of the some of the the neighborhoods that aren't as wealthy, you may have multiple families living in houses. You may have four or five or six families living in a three bedroom house. That that's a completely different challenge. Mm -hmm. Then you move over to the gigantic houses, the 10,000, 12,000 square foot houses, those are create a whole new challenge in search. Um, probably the last thing for us is we have the opportunity for all of our um, commercial buildings in Louisville get inspected on a regular basis. Those people have identified seven to 10 occupancies that they're pretty sure people live in. So just because it's a commercial occupancy doesn't mean we don't search it. Um, we have, we know there's one that we're pretty sure that there's an entire family 
there's no exterior doors that lead out of that occupancy where they live. Um, and, and it doesn't look like a place where a family would be living. And so we have those challenges to overcome any point that we're going to go go do search. And that's and we a great, that that's we're a great get point. So. That's a great point. I mean, you, you, you hit on, Seth, expect the unexpected. I mean, that, you know, uh, and we didn't even talk about multiple family because, I mean, we only have an hour and it flies by, as you saw. Um, but to expect unexpected when you go in there, things are going to be chopped up, related living, things that aren't, you know, your building department doesn't know about. And like you said, um, you know, multiple families living in the same, some of those smaller structures are going to present. It goes back to to, to what, what Grant was talking about and what Garrett talked about, about having enough people there to do the job. Thinking big, man, thinking big. Garrett, closing thoughts, buddy. Um, thanks for having me on. I just appreciate the opportunity. Um, one thing I would say is Recio is working. It's been working and rescue is the, is the first thing that we need to tend to. And, uh, you know, from my position, that means supporting that, uh, supporting that effort. And, and most of that isn't on the fire ground. It's prior to that. And it's holding my officers accountable, holding our firemen accountable and ensuring that we're training people up, uh, so that they can go in without the senses, like you said and have a chance at success. Be that citizen's uh, best opportunity for success. Um, I tell all my people, and I said, it, I, I said it first as a company officer, and I've said it as a battalion, and it's probably pretty harsh. But I tell them, if you don't think I will risk you today, I would find another profession. I will 100% risk your life today. I have no problems doing that. But I do that with a clear conscience because we train our people. And I could look at, uh, uh, unfortunately, maybe a widow in the eye and say, sorry, it went bad today, but it wasn't due to a lack of training. It wasn't due to us not preparing them, giving them the best tools and equipment. We just had a bad day. And so you have to be willing to take these risks. This is the job. I sat in church the other day and the, the priest equated faith to the faith that we have in the 911 system, that that's our, our faith in God should be at that level. Can you imagine the en enormity in that? That's what our citizens feel like. So if they're saying that, that 911 never fails, we have to come through on that promise. And the only way we can do that is through training. Absolutely. Great message. Terry, Terry, you got anything before we close things out, buddy, to my partner? Uh, you know, no, not really. You guys, you guys, uh, you know, kind of covered everything, Gary. And I appreciate you saying the, uh, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in holding people accountable. I'm a firm believer in levying expectations and making sure that people rise up to meet those expectations. And I think that's important at every level in an organization. Um, and, and, and you need to have a lot of internal, you should always have a lot of internal pressure. I, I do it to myself. I'm probably harder on myself, but I think that's what, that's what, you know, helps get the job done. And I, and I think it's important that, that that's a, a, a bit of the focus. I also just want to say that, and, and because we're short on time, but every one of these guests that you're seeing teaches uh, on a lot. Uh, uh, Captain Taylor here in Louisville, they do an all saws class. They've done truck classes, forcible entry class. They've done a, a, a variety of stuff. And you can contact Seth by uh, first initial last name, Seth Taylor at cityofluisville.com. Feel free to shoot him an email, uh, find out what he's got in the hopper. Uh, and I can assure you, I've never found anyone that walks away from his classes that, that hasn't learned uh, a, an incredible amount. Uh, and there's a lot of people there from a lot of different organizations and both within the state of Texas and outside as well. I know that Grant is out there teaching. I know that Garrett teaches. I know that Scott, Scott looks a little bit like the king of the north right now. I keep looking at him in this grand chair. Um, <laughs> with, with the way the shade is? Oh, well, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but anyway, I, I reach out to any of these uh, individuals and, uh, and, and they will be a tremendous resource to you. And, and uh, best of luck and and i hope that uh, this last hour has been informational perfect perfect thanks my, my, my partner and my buddy hey scott uh emails for you and garrett uh yes first initial last name at the colony tx.gov perfect perfect grant if they want to get hold of you buddy uh facebook or grant schwalbe at gmail.com common spelling and I, and I, and Terry, <laughs> Terry, <laughs> Terry mentioned Seth and his classes. Uh, um, Seth, I hope I'm not going out in the wrong direction, but uh, if, if anybody out there is looking for someone that knows how to build them, you want to, you want, you want to hire a guy to come out and build you a fourth century door, or some props and that that's the guy 
I don't know how busy he is, but um, it's it's worth the money you're going to spend to have him do that for you. Um, I, I'm I'm proud when I go place a set and I hear not only about your classes and how great you're doing, but the people you built some of your props for. Are like we, they're like one of them said, we can't wreck it. We whatever we do, we can't wreck it. And I know your talent as a welder and everything else that you do, but uh, uh, I hope I'm not, like I said, walking out there where I should. But if if if, if you're still doing that, if people want to hire you to come out there, that they need to do it. They need to hire you to come build them a prop. And if you're Especially if you're a chief and your truck ever asks for a welder, just buy it for them. Don't ask questions and other great things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys. Well, hey. Guys, thanks so much for jumping on board. Another great show. Another great show. Another great topic. It, the hour always flies by, man. It always flies by. And, uh, Terry and I do our best to, you know, to to, to kind of get everybody in, in, involved. And it's it's, it's some great information. Uh, uh, we always get a ton of great feedback on these shows, and this will be another one. Um, we're all folks are to our to our viewers. We're all on Facebook and Twitter. We got our website. So do a search. Everybody knows how to use Google. And I uh, just head over to any of those uh, sites. Next show date is September 18th. Um, uh, I think I'm traveling. That might be uh, my, my good buddy Terry McGrath had things up like he does a lot. Uh, but September 18th, uh, the, every third Wednesday here for our show, Issues and Challenges. Fire Engineering always has some great shows here Wednesdays, uh, 12, 12 you know, p.m. Uh, Central Time, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time with some great and awesome people. It gives you a chance to interact with some folk. But in closing, Terry and I, uh, we always end our shows this way. We'd like to ask you to Please keep the men and women serving in armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. And remember, never forgetting means never forgetting. Be safe and God bless you. Thanks for, for, for joining us today.